After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with proclaiming the word, testifying to the Jews that the Messiah was Jesus. When they opposed and reviled him, in protest he shook the dust from his clothes and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. Then he left the synagogue and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the official of the synagogue, became a believer in the Lord, together with all his household and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul became believers and were baptized. He stayed there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of crime or of serious vill villainy, I would be justified in accepting the complaint of you Jews. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I do not wish to be a judge over these matters. And he dismissed them from the tribunal. After staying there for a considerable time, Paul said farewell to the believers and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Good evening. Welcome back to our study of Acts of the Apostles. We are resuming our study tonight after a three-week hiatus. We're beginning our study of the 18th chapter of Acts. The Apostle Paul, as you may remember, has been on his second missionary journey. His journey began at his home church in Antioch in Syria, and we traveled with him through Tarsus, Derbe, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch in Pisidia, and Troas in Asia Minor, where he received a call from God to go to Macedonia. In Macedonia, he traveled to Samothrace, Neapolis, Philippi, Amphipolis, Apollonia, Thessalonica, Berea, and Athens. Although his time in Athens was short, we spent several weeks looking at Paul's ministry there, because of the major speech that he delivered to the Athenians. Now our focus for the next two weeks will be on his ministry in Corinth. Now just because we are devoting only two weeks to this visit doesn't mean that his ministry there was minor. The apostle spent more than more time in Corinth than in any other city in the, on this journey, 18 months. And later on he would spend another three months there. Although the church at Corinth had its problems, when Paul left for the last time, he left a church of several hundred that was healthy and growing. So, let's pray together and we will begin our lesson for tonight. <clears throat> we thank you, our Father, for our time together, for calling us back together to continue our study of this great book. And as we always do, Lord, we ask you to come in the power of in the wisdom of your Holy Spirit, speak to us, challenge us, and help us to grow in Christ as we study together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In our study of this event in Paul's ministry, we're going to see something that we have never seen before. Paul is going to get discouraged. His discouragement is probably the cumulative result of of all the rejection and violence against him that has happened throughout this journey. As we will see, his experience at the synagogue in Corinth seems to have been the last straw for him. 
After leaving Athens, Paul headed for Corinth. He was joined there by Timothy and Silas. Luke, who had accompanied him on only part of this journey, remained in Ephesus. All right, now what do we know about Corinth in this time of Paul? Well, we know that it was a major commercial city where sea routes from the east and west met, and where land trade routes from the north and south met. This was an ideal place, as far as Paul was concerned, to preach the gospel, because the believers could then take the message along those trade routes, north, south, east, and west, and share the gospel wherever they went. Later, he would see the city of Rome in the same way. The message received in Rome could, could be taken to the vast areas of the Roman Empire, moving along the uh, what we might call the superhighways of the Roman Empire. Now, Corinth was absolutely destroyed in 146 BC. It was leveled due to a revolt against the Roman government. Not until a hundred years later, Julius Caesar rebuilt the city in 44 BC, and it soon regained its former prominence as a shipping and trade center. In the older days before its destruction, Corinth had a reputation for its sexual license. In classic Greek, for example, the phrase, act the Corinthian, meant to practice fornication. And a girl labeled a Corinthian girl was in reality a prostitute. In Paul's day, that sexual license continued. The temple of Aphrodite on the Acropolis of Corinth gave a religious tone to this sexual activity. That's right. They had sexual practices while they were worshiping their false gods. Paul indicates in his two letters to the church he founded in Corinth that the believers there had difficulty maintaining Christian sexual morality due to their previous religious practices at that temple. All right, with that introduction to the city of Corinth, let's turn to the 18th chapter of Acts. And I'm reading from verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius, that is the Roman emperor, had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Now this wasn't the first time that Claudius expelled what we might call undesirables from the capital city of the Roman Empire. One Jewish historian, Suetonius, tells us that the Jews were expelled because they were, quote, indulging in constant riots at the instigation of Crestus, <clears throat> unquote. <clears throat> now, who was this Crestus? Well, there is the possibility that there may have been a man in Rome at this time who was causing upheavals among the Jews for some unknown reason. But that doesn't appear in any of the historical records. But one commentator states that Suetonius would have identified him with the words, a certain Crestus. The same commentator believes that Crestus is Christ. Now, Suetonius, writing 70 years after these events, probably thought that Crestus, or Christ, was in Rome causing the disruptions. Of course, he wasn't. Whatever the situation, Suetonius was probably writing about the introduction of Christianity in one of the synagogues of Rome at the time when Aquila and Priscilla lived there. And there was a violent reaction, or maybe more than one violent reaction, from the people of that synagogue. <clears throat> now, we're not told that this husband and wife team, Priscilla and Aquila, were part of the, of the dissension that was going on in Rome, or if they were simply part of the community that was expelled. Nor does Luke tell us that the two were Christians when they met Paul. Since the text does not tell us that Paul led them to Christ, it is more likely that they were already believers when they met him. So Paul went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they worked together. By trade, they were tent makers. <clears throat> 
Every Sabbath, he would argue in the synagogue and would try to convince Jews and Greeks. Now, we're not told why Paul went to see Priscilla and Aquila. Perhaps he heard from some unknown source that there were some believers in Christ in Corinth. Naturally, he would search them out. Or he may have found them in one of the synagogues or the main synagogue in which he was preaching. Or he may have found them in the same way he found Lydia in Philippi. Do you remember Lydia? She was a seller of purple dye, you may remember. And Paul found her by a river where Jews would gather for prayer on a Saturday morning. Well, we don't know why uh, Paul um, went to see them or uh, how he found them. Whatever the case, their fellowship increased when they discovered not only a common faith, but also a common trade. They were tent makers. Now today, we would call people like Paul, who raised their support through secular employment, bivocational. Paul's relationship with Priscilla and Aquila lasted beyond their time in Corinth, as we shall see. A few weeks after Paul's arrival in Corinth, Silas and Timothy, his two traveling companions, arrived from Macedonia. Not surprisingly, they found Paul doing what, well, what Paul did, proclaiming the word in the synagogues, testifying to the Jews that the Messiah was Jesus. You will note Paul's constant focus on his number one priority, proclaiming the gospel. Several years had passed since he began his first missionary journey, and since then he had been stoned, beaten, left for dead, falsely imprisoned, and run out of several communities. None of these negative experiences stopped him from fulfilling his calling. But let me add that Paul also instilled in the churches he founded, both by precept and by example, that those churches and the believers that make them up also have a calling, a mission, that is no different from his, proclaiming the gospel. When Timothy and Silas arrived, they brought good news to Paul. Here's what happened according to Paul's own words found in his first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 3. Listen. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love. He has told us also that you always remember us kindly and long to see us, just as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers and sisters, during all our distress and persecution, we have been encouraged about you through your faith. And we now live if you continue to stand firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Unquote. Now this por portion of Paul's first letter to this church at Thessalonica reveals so much of Paul's compassion toward the churches he established. He wanted to be with those he f who found Christ under his ministry. He wanted to encourage them in their faith. He wanted to see them endure in that faith despite terrible persecution. He wanted to protect them from enemies. He wanted them to fulfill their mission. The second bit of good news came in the form of a financial gift from the believers in Philippi. In his letter to the church at Philippi, Paul wrote of his appreciation for the several gifts that that church had sent him while he was in Thessalonica and afterwards. The most recent gift Paul received from that church came through a man whose name was Epaphroditus. Paul described that gift as a, quote, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God, unquote. These financial gifts relieved him of his duties as a tent maker so that he could devote his time preaching the gospel. Imagine how wonderful it is for missionaries today to receive gifts from their homeland and from their home churches, gifts to buy equipment or Bibles 
or edu Christian education materials or personal necessities. Sometimes the support comes in packages that address specific needs of the missionaries. I believe there needs to be a personal link between every missionary and at least one home church. I wonder how many members of your local church know the name of one missionary serving on the field. I confess that I do not know any United Methodist missionaries. In the four years I've been associated with the United Methodist Church, not one missionary has visited any of the congregations that I serve. Now in the sixth verse of chapter 18, we have what appears to be a strategic change in the way Paul carried out his ministry in these different cities and towns. As we have already noted, Paul began his ministry in Corinth just as he began his ministry in all the other places he had visited. He first went to the synagogues, and when given the opportunity, he shared the message that Jesus is the Messiah that they had been looking for for centuries. In this case, the people of the synagogue rejected his message, sternly rejected his message, as a matter of fact. The text says they opposed him and reviled him. The word reviled in the original means that they blasphemed him. They falsely accused him. So severe was their reaction against him that he decided he must find a new and better way to proclaim the gospel, at least to the Jews in Corinth. This incident seems to have broken Paul's spirit, and he reacted against these people more strongly than at any other time. As a strong gesture of protest and warning to them, Paul shook the dust from his clothes. You may remember that Jesus, as recorded in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9 and 10, told his disciples to shake the dust off their feet in those places where they and the gospel were rejected. The idea be behind that act was to issue a warning that the condemnation was so severe that even the dust would be affected. And so shaking the dust off was a way of saying, I don't even want your dust attached to me. The warning was also accompanied by a verbal warning. Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. Now, let's be very careful how we think about what Paul just said. Here is one interpretation of what he said, and I would strongly disagree with it, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Because Paul preached the gospel to these people, and they rejected his message, then he had no responsibility on their being lost. He had done his job, and so he was innocent. He could not be blamed for the loss of their souls. All that is true. No problem with that at all. If he had not preached the gospel to them when he was supposed to, then he could be blamed for their lost state. Now that is one interpretation, but I don't think it's correct, at least the last sentence that I shared with you. We are not responsible for the lost condition of any person, whether we preach to them or not. Don't misunderstand me. We ought to proclaim the gospel as far and wide to as many people as we can. It's one of the great privileges we have as believers. But God doesn't hold us responsible for the salvation of people. What Paul was saying here is that these people, having heard the gospel, brought damnation onto themselves by their rejection of it. His words and his action of shaking the dust off his clothes was about as stern of a warning as he could possibly give them. We should note also that Paul was not saying that he would not go to the Jews anymore, he did decide that he would not go to these Jews, knowing the kind of reputation they would, they would give him. Or, I'm sorry, the kind of re reception they would give him. I think we can conclude that Paul was very discouraged with the behavior of these Jews toward him. Later in this chapter, we will see how the Lord gave him a vision with words of encouragement. The prophet Ezekiel expresses the sentiment of what Paul was saying. They heard the sound of the trumpet and did not take warning. Their blood shall be upon themselves. But if they had taken warning, they would have saved their lives. Now notice that that passage lays the blame for people being lost, not on the preacher or the lack of the preacher, but upon the, 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 uh, the individual uh, who could believe. All right, verse 7. Then he left the synagogue and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, 
a worshiper of God. Now, remember that whenever the New Testament refers to uh, a person as a worshiper of God, what he, is, what he is saying is that that person was a Gentile who had come to believe in the Jewish God. Now, in this case, uh, Titius Justus lived next door to the synagogue. So here was a Gentile who worshipped Israel's God among the Jewish people, and he lived next door to the temple. So Paul didn't have far to go from the synagogue to find someone who would hear his message and believe it. This man undoubtedly worshipped in the synagogue, but his days worshipping there were very likely over. As a result of believe, as a believer in Christ, he would no longer be welcome in the synagogue. Now, in Roman culture, a person had three names, and there's a Latin term for each of those names. What was the first name of Titius Justus? Well, we don't know. But historians have suggested that his first name was Gaius, G-A-I-U-S. If that is the case, then he may have been the Gaius that Paul mentioned in his first letter to the Corinthians as one of a few converts that he personally baptized. In Romans 16, verse 23, Paul mentions Gaius again, saying, Gaius, who is host to me and to the whole church, says hello to you. We know that from the letter to the Romans, In Roman culture, a person had three names, and there's a Latin term for each of those three names. What was the first name of this man, Titius Justus? Well, we don't know, but historians have suggested that his first name may have been Gaius. If that is the case, then he may have been the Gaius that Paul mentions in his first letter to the Corinthians as one of a few converts that he personally baptized. In Romans 16, chapter 16, verse 23, Paul mentions Gaius again, saying, Gaius, who is host to me and to the whole church, says hello to you. Where was Paul when he wrote that to the Romans? He was in Corinth. So it's very likely that Gaius played host to Paul as long as he was in Corinth and allowed Paul to remain in his home. That would be uh, Titius Justice. Another convert that Paul personally baptized was Crispus, the official of the synagogue. He and his entire family believed in the Lord. Now you have to understand how costly it was for Crispus to believe in Christ. His new faith turned his world upside down. He too, like Titius Justice, was vitally connected to the synagogue, perhaps more so than, than uh, Titius Justice. He was the official of the synagogue, but no more. His life took an entirely new direction as he came to follow Christ. Was it Paul's stern warning to the synagogue congregation that caused some of these people to rethink their attitude toward Paul and his message? We are told that, in addition to a few from the synagogue, many of the Corinthians who heard Paul, beca heard Paul became believers and were baptized. Thus, a church was started in the city of Corinth. In verses 9 and 10 of this chapter, we have the first of three separate visions that God gives Paul that serve to encourage him. Now listen, most people going through the, what Paul had gone through on this missionary journey would probably have turned in their resignation long before this point. Paul had endured through significant trials and pain. The treatment he received from the congregation at the synagogue brought back memories of previous rejection 
by his fellow Jews. Paul was discouraged, and I would suggest even depressed, over what was happening in his life. Was he beginning to shrink back from speaking out, or at least tempted to do so? Verses 9 and 10 tell us what God did. One night the Lord said to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you to harm you, for there are many in this city who are my people. Now, if this vision answers Paul's concerns, then his concern was for his own safety, because that's what, the, that's what God promises uh, Paul in this vision, safety. His opponents had made it impossible for him to remain in Thessalonica and Berea, but that would not be the case in Corinth. In fact, God did, God did protect Paul from harm to the, to the extent that he stayed there in Corinth for a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Now let me talk with you for a moment about discouragement. Do you know that pastors and other Christian workers get discouraged quite frequently? In fact, many pastors spend much of their lives clinically depressed. They need to be on medication. This is especially true of pastors of smaller churches. They do all that they can trying to bring about the growth of the congregation, but nothing seems to work. And so they look at themselves as failures. This is especially true when they see some of their seminary classmates serving large churches, and they wonder, well, what's wrong with me? Why hasn't this happened to me? Pastors of small churches are often underpaid. The spouse must work to keep them afloat financially, or they must have a second job themselves, which keeps them from doing what they believe they are called to do. Pastors get discouraged when families leave the church, often unannounced. They just stop coming and start going to another church without any explanation whatsoever. Whether announced or not, a family leaving the church is a discouragement to the pastor, other times, a person doesn't leave the church, but lets the pastor know in no uncertain terms of the disagreements with him or her. There, so there's an underlying drone of discontent that takes its toll on the emotional life of the pastor. Most people have one boss in their work, but some pastors have a whole congregation of bosses who believe it's their responsibility to tell the pastor what to do. Then there is the stress and strain on marriages and family life brought into the homes by a discouraged pastor. I am told that 50% of pastors leave the ministry after just a few years of service to the church. Now think about it. A pastor spends four years in college and three to four years in seminary training for the ministry. In some conferences, the seminary education is paid for by the conference many thousands of, or tens of thousands of dollars. But half of those pastors are out of the ministry within a few years after seminary. What a tragic loss of equipped workers and the finances that made it all happen. All of this because of discouragement. So let me ask you, pray for your pastors. Pray for missionaries and do all that you can to encourage and support them in their work for Christ. Now, that doesn't mean they will, they will always do the right things or make the right decisions, and it doesn't mean they should not be corrected at times. Nevertheless, come down on the side of encouragement as much as possible. Well, we're out of time for this week. We'll take up here next week as we continue to look at Paul's ministry in Corinth. Let's pray together as we close. Thank you, Lord, for this great story of Paul's work in Corinth and the things we learn from him about what it means to lead churches served in the kingdom of God. We learn from him the challenges, the significant challenges that uh, Christian workers face as they serve. Help us, Lord, to be on the side of encouragement to our pastors, our missionaries, and other, other people who serve in the kingdom of God. Now, Lord, bring us back again next week as we continue our study of this great book. We thank you and we praise you. In Christ's name, amen.
Well, thank you for joining me. God bless you. It's great to see you. Looking forward to coming together again next week.